The saga of Frost Aridin continues, and this time, we're going to get Skelga. Now, I open up with a card I didn't actually get to mention before. It's Muzzle. Muzzle allows me to steal a card from my opponent's side of the board and put it on my own, so long as it's under uh, 8 strength or less. It's a pretty interesting card that has varied value sometimes, you know, like at worst, or, you know, a typical not-so-great situation is maybe you only steal like a 4 strength card that has no other effect. Then it's only an 8 strength, uh, eight strength swing for a gold card, which isn't very good, right? You're trying to aim for that 16, right? You're trying to go for that that 8 strength card that you steal over and send over to your side, and it has a 16 in total uh, strength swing. And if you can also combo it to also take away a valuable piece of your opponent's win condition, then even better. Uh, but usually that's more around the 6th to 7th strength, so it's a little bit less in strength, maybe a little bit more in overall value. It's a really interesting card. Uh, it was seen quite a lot in the Quent Open, where <laughs> if you watched it, you would see, you know, someone would muzzle, and then it would just get muzzled right back, and basically nothing happened. Uh, but on the latter, it's a little bit more, there's a little bit less of that going around. There's a little bit less people taking muzzle. And at the same time, the cards that I've found that I'm taking... <clears throat> excuse me, aren't actually all that useful. Like this Mark Varg. Uh, it, it really, I think it's most helpful against decks like Spell a Towel and like Reveal Nilfgaard if used a couple times against. But otherwise, it's an interesting card. So anyway, in this game, uh, not actually the whole lot is going on here. I'm just kind of showing off some of this uh, this crone usage. I go, I went ahead and used it first. I don't believe, I don't remember, I don't recall how in depth I went with that last time. And basically, I'm using crones in one or two situations. One is to play it immediately on going first in the first round, because then I could I get to stay ahead in tempo and I allow myself to play flexibly with uh with like Wild Hunt Hounds and Frost and things like that without being in danger of being passed on my opponent and going two cards down just to keep up. And crones gives me that flexibility. So it's really nice in that sense. At the same time, it thins out my deck. Uh, the second usage is to use it as a turn or round three rather finisher to save it as your very last card until that point and i believe that's how i won the last game regardless crones are really interesting uh if you play since like closed beta you know that uh crones have been a staple of the monsters deck but not so much in these uh in these times these are trying times for the crones so far i think it's pretty much just this frost Aridin deck and ones like it that i've been using uh, crones, but I really like crones. I think like crones and cards like Siri are what make Gwent so unique, so different, so interesting. There's not a lot of other card games out there that will allow you to take away power in the deck building, like the deck management, to give it power within the cards themselves. So, as you know, crones are three silver slots out of six silver slots. So, you're taking away two valuable silver slots. So you can have a little bit more power in a match to match. So it's really interesting in that, like in that, uh, in that aspect. Like, can you imagine if Hearthstone only allowed you to take like two legendaries or something like that, and then you would have one legendary that was just like half of another legendary or something? I don't know. It would be crazy. It'd be really cool, but crazy. That actually not. I mean, Hearthstone's already way too far in this development, but. It would be pretty interesting if they actually went and decided to change it so you could only have like two legendaries, two epics, or four epics, you know, six rare or something like that. Or if they introduced some kind of like competition, like a tournament where they did that, that'd be really interesting. I know Duelist did a lot of that kind of stuff, uh, like popper tournaments. But anyway, so in this game, uh, not a whole lot happened. He cleared my frost, that dang Gremis that is always being running uh, Skellige, and he's no doubt going to restore or revive it somehow later. So that's going to be a pain. To deal with. I think he just decoyed it this time. So one thing that I had to worry about. Uh, I actually kind of misplayed. I played a little bit too much into my weather. Instead of just. Uh, this is another situation where I'm. I'm like deathly afraid of giving up round one control. Even if it's for the better play. Like if you watch the Gwent Open tournament. Uh, specifically Freddy Babes. The, the winner of it. Spoiler. <clears throat> he was really really good at. Knowing exactly when he needed to go out in the round, even if you wouldn't traditionally think you should. Or in other words, he didn't he didn't want to overplay too much into round one because he knew he'd be able to manipulate the the, the further rounds, the rounds preceding that. In such a way that it doesn't really matter that he stopped, uh, quote unquote, early. Right. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I don't not sure I'm really at that skill level just yet, but I'm definitely working on it. 
at least to a certain extent. So I open up this uh, this round, even though I did steal his Mark Varg, um, which which is to say I didn't I could have used my spy on this round if I had won the round against his Mark Varg, and then he I would have basically canceled out the effects of his carryover. But I still go ahead and go with the same plane anyway. I you, I thin out my spy out of my deck because otherwise it doesn't really matter. I'm playing one card. He's playing one card. I did get a pretty valuable card out of him. He, was, he may have played that card anyway. So I guess it's just, like again, like playing a spy in that situation doesn't really matter because all you're doing is thinning that spy out of your deck for a different card. And there's something to be said about allowing yourself to mulligan the card that comes from the spy into round three. But if you already have all the mulligan targets, it doesn't really matter in that situation either. <clears throat> I did kind of think about pushing that round out, but I don't think I had the hand I wanted to do so. We're playing this out. We're playing this out. Let's speed this up. Get rid of one of those riders because uh, riders become significantly less useful without frost on the board. If they have no frost on the board, they're basically worthless or not worthless, but weaker than the average bronze value. So I go ahead and caretaker. I caretaker his uh, one of his win conditions, which is his uh, his uh, I forget what it's called. It's not called skirmisher. It's called like mercenary or something like that. Yeah, I took away his mercenary. Even if I did play it a little bit early, I want to make sure he did not have uh, access to it. <coughs> Very coffee today. So I don't have any frost yet. I don't believe I have any in the graveyard, or else I would have used it already. I think, or maybe. Uh, I didn't check to see his graveyard because I played against so much Skellige. It's all just blending together. Uh, he does have a Gremis in there. I'm surprised I didn't take his Gremis away. I guess I'm. I guess in this specific game, I didn't actually have any weather left because if he, if I did have weather left, I probably would have taken the Gremis instead. Like, cause, uh, hmm, hmm. I guess I did have weather left. Huh. My play is a little bit confusing here. So I guess. Uh, I had the toss up between going for Gremis or I had the toss up. Uh, I mean, I had the toss up between going for Gremis or going for Mercenary, and I went for Mercenary instead because I felt that Mercenary was overall a bigger hindrance to my plan than a Gremis would. Now he has to take it. He has to balance the the issue of Gremisting, uh, clear skying's one weather or using the blood curdling roar on his one strength Priestess of Freya. Now, if you played. As a lot of this deck, as a lot of Frost Aridon, you know you'd pretty much like you would take the hit, I think, and go for Clear Skies because the rest of my hand is so incredible. Like the entire deck of Frost Aridon is so incredibly reliant on having Frost on the board that if you don't actually have it, you're in a really bad place. And see, I guess it didn't even really matter that I stole away his Skirmisher anyway because he played, he had, I mean, he had two mercenaries rather in the graveyard and I only took one. The one I took was a little bit stronger, but really those points don't matter when it comes to uh, like the frost that I have on the board. I guess I did take away his second one, but that isn't really, that's, I think I'm, I took the, I went for a lower EV play. No, no, I, I went for a straight up high EV play but maybe a lower EV play in the grand scheme of playing Frost Aridon, I think is the idea I'm trying to make. <clears throat> I think if I had two Frost, maybe I would have played this a little bit differently. That's assuming he didn't already play Sigdrufa, which I don't think he did in this game. And of course, I have my Eris uh, with that Wild Hunt Rider. Now, this is actually a thing that I've, uh, over the past couple days that I've learned, and I'll probably even showcase a match where this happens. Uh, actually, I don't. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is a problem that I've been making a lot. Like opponents are actually getting really sneaky about dealing with Idris. So in this situation, what I should have done, because uh, the whole thing is I'm fearing like an Igni, a Smite or a Blizzard. And generally, those are things that are pretty OK to look out for. But at the same time, in certain situations, if I'm not able to get my Eris off, I'm not only giving him points away. I'm not only, I'm not only not putting points on the board on my side, but I'm not getting the value out of Iris, which is the 25 points, which may very well usurp any possible downside of any um, of any Punisher that they have, as opposed to just not getting that value at all. Uh, so in other words, let me let me pare that down a little bit. I am making a mistake here, but not playing Iris earlier. I should have played Iris in a situation where I know I'm going to get the Wild Hunt Hound proc off with this. Otherwise, I risk her not going off. And that's a 
that's something that's come up in my games quite a bit, actually, is that that's been happening. So anyway, this is all, like we can almost consider this like a deck spotlight part two. I did show off Frost, uh, some more Frost. I showed off dealing with Gremist, not particularly well, but uh, showed that off. Went into the particulars of using Irish. You sh- in my opinion, Irish should not be saved as the very last card, but maybe the second or third to last card. So you can be more sure that it does actually go off. Even if they do, even if they're, they have a guaranteed Punisher, it's probably not going to match the value Irish is going to give. And if Irish doesn't go off and you're afraid of that Punisher, then, you know, the whole thing is just moot. You just lose. Play Irish earlier. Frost. Crones. Yeah, that's good. That, that That's a solid video. We're done for today. Thanks for watching.